Chairman, I'm delighted to be here with my colleagues tonight, with the chair of our Rules Committee, Amy Klobuchar, who worked so hard and so intensely on the For the People Act and the uh, For People Act 2.0, Freedom to Vote Act, uh, that were sought to address the foundations of democracy in our country. And I'm delighted to be here with the former governor and senator from New Hampshire, who really understands from both the state and national perspective the importance of the rules of democracy. And to my colleague from Maine, who was just speaking about the election of 1876 that had so many parallels to election of 2020. Because in that year, there were four states that submitted two different slates. And the Republican Party said, let the vice president decide because he's targeted in the Constitution to receive the ballots. And the Democrats said, well, he's not given the power in the Constitution to decide which slate of ballots to accept. And uh, that led to a, a standoff and a commission that was set up of five senators and five House members and five Supreme Court justices to try to decide which slate of ballots to accept. And as he pointed out, uh, that, um, that election led to the Electoral Count Act for the first round. And 10 years later, they rewrote it again. But it wasn't sufficient. And I just want to compliment for him and the work that the entire set of senators did uh, to bring forward uh, a much improved version that will be included in the omnibus bill we'll be considering. As I'm here with my colleagues pondering pondering the state of our democracy, the state of our republic. I can't help but think about that story from Benjamin Franklin and the Constitutional Convention, seeing him walk out of Independence Hall on the last day of the convention. A woman came up and asked Dr. Franklin, well, doctor, what have we got? Is it a republic or a monarchy? To which Dr. Franklin replied, a republic if you can keep it. A republic if you can keep it. Recognizing the challenge of sustaining this framework in which we voluntarily work together to have a system of ballot integrity, of registration integrity, of voting integrity, and in fact of counting the ballots with integrity. And if I go back to that battle of uh, 1876, the deal that was struck was a dark deal. It was a deal which said, as my colleague uh, Senator King pointed out, that we will take, even though one candidate was one vote short of winning the Electoral College, we will give those four slates to the Republican if the Republican will pull the trips out of the South and Reconstruction. And what that meant was ending civil rights for black Southerners, not for one or two generations, but for the better part of three quarters of a century, three generations. It was a terrible, dark, evil deal that came out. But in this body, there was a senator who said, we need to restore those rights to the South. And he waited through 88, 1888, on into 1890, until there was a possibility of passing a bill that would protect voting registration, voting at the ballot box, and the counting of votes. It was called the Lodge Act. Sir Henry Cabot Lodge from the House, who there came to the Senate, uh, supported it and sent it over here, and Senator Hoare. Senator Hoare proceeded to champion it in this body, and it was a filibuster by Southern Democrats that killed that bill. A filibuster later accompanied by support, actually, from Northern Republicans. Northern Republicans who wanted to get to a tariff bill, the Kennelly Tariff Act, and supported by Western Republicans who wanted to get to the Silver Currency Bill. In other words, people from all over the country in this chamber failed to stand up for the civil rights of every American. It is indeed true that our institutions are far more fragile 
than we ever anticipated. We believe in the vision of a republic, and how does that differ from the vision of a, of a dictator? It differs from a dictator or a king in that power flows up from the people. It doesn't flow down from the powerful. But we have seen a steady erosion of that vision here in the United States of America. With the wealth inequality, we have come to see that there is an incredible loss of government of, by, and for the people. Let me explain. When you get that kind of power concentrated at the very top, that money becomes sets of lawyers who work 24-7, 365 for the powerful and against the people. You get that kind of concentration, you get media campaigns spending huge sums of money to change how people think about issues. Power for the powerful, not government by the people. And then let's think about the fact that that same set of powerful are using campaign funds to get the outcomes they want, and they're using dark money. My colleague, Senator Whitehouse, was talking about the Disclose Act and how important it is that we least have transparency. Where are these hundreds of millions of dollars from the richest Americans and most powerful corporations coming from, and what is their goal? At least we should know the who. The Supreme Court has said they cannot be stopped under kind of a corrupted vision of free speech. They can't be limited under that Supreme Court decision. But at least we can know the who and understand better how the American people be understand who is behind the funding. That ending of dark money is so important. Gerrymandering. It's estimated that down the hall, in the House of Representatives, there is a 20 to 25 vote bias in favor of one party over the other because one party does more gerrymandering than the other. Well, neither should do that. And it's our responsibility to end that corrupt distortion of equal representation. And then to the ballot box. 34 laws passed in 19 states aimed at one mission, and that's to stop targeted groups of Americans from voting. And who are those targeted groups? Those targeted groups are black Americans and Hispanic Americans. It's low-income inner-city Americans. It's Native Americans on reservations. It's college students. Laws deliberately designed in a laser-focused manner to block certain groups of Americans from voting. That's the powerful who don't want to have the voice of the people working for the people. Well, we had, last January, a chance to pass a bill in this chamber, just like they had in 1891, to pass civil rights for all Americans. For us, it wasn't the Lodge Act. For us, it was the Freedom to Vote Act, the freedom to vote that would take on gerrymandering, that would end anonymous dark money, that would proceed to ensure that every American can get to the ballot box in a fair fashion to vote. You know, it was in 2018, excuse me, in 2020, we had one state where the wait time in predominantly black precincts to vote was five to 10 times the wait time in white precincts. Don't tell me that that is somehow acceptable in the United States of America, that kind of racial bias baked into our election system. It was deliberate, it was planned. And why is it that President Trump hated vote by mail? Well, let me explain it to you. He hated it because it let people get to the ballot box that he didn't want to vote. He wanted people to have to vote on election day because on election day, you can really, really play the game. You can move the voting locations from where they were the previous election so people don't go to the right place. 
The places where you don't want people to vote, you put them where there's no parking lots so that it's hard to vote. You put out false information about when the election was, saying, so sorry you missed it, even though it's this coming Tuesday, people will think it's the last Tuesday. You can manipulate and obstruct targeted groups of Americans and prevent them voting much easier on election day than you can vote by mail. Now, my, my state of Oregon initiated vote by mail. It is the most secure system in the country. Every signature compared. You would be more likely to be struck by lightning than be able to find a mistake made in which somebody voted intentionally who wasn't allowed to vote. Incredibly secure. Incredibly appropriate to counteract all of those schemes on election day designed to target Americans. My colleagues, we have so much work to do to defend the very foundation of our democracy. It is the ballot box. It's the ballot box. We have to take on the gerrymandering. We have to take on the dark money. And we have to defend the opportunity of every American to vote. If you came into this room and you swore an oath to the Constitution, you have a responsibility to defend that Constitution and defend the integrity of the ballot box. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President. This senator from Minnesota.